Well, most of you might know that the German army in the Second World was heavily dependent on horses. After all, at the beginning of the war, it possessed around 590,000 horses. Similarly, when the Wehrmacht invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, it brought 600,000 motor vehicles, yet 625,000 horses as well. As such, I thought it would be interesting to look at some contemporary sources and what was written about the horse or military horse. For this, we take a look at the Army volume from 1937 of the four volume Encyclopedia Neuzeitliche Wehrwissenschaften, Modern Military Sciences which was quite an investment, made possible by my Patreon subscribers or supporters. The series was published by a retired general. Among the many authors was Guderian and before the preface there is a statement by General von Fritsch, who back then was the commander-in-chief of the German army. So this is probably the most official, semi-official publication for the time on the German military. Now be aware, there will be some eerie yet also hilarious parts in this video. Anyway, let's head on in. The article about the military horse starts with the following passage. Since its taming by man, the horse has played a preeminent role in the lives of nations. The horse has been an important means of warfare in the earliest times and has remained so until today, despite the change in fighting methods and motorization. Now remember here that in the first war, the carry was used rather rarely aside from the opening moves of the conflict. This is also reflected by the statements in the article about the supply services that noted that the losses in the first war from combat were low, but a lot of the horses died from continuous overload and insufficient care. The article continues about the importance of horses for the modern military. States, which as a result of the geographical location and politics may get in position to which land wars, must therefore pay special attention to their national horse breeding so that the horses needed for the armed forces can be provided by it alone in sufficient number and quality. One key aspect that many countries like Germany, Austria, yet also Japan learned during the First World War was that self-sufficiency was crucial for the survival in a prolonged conflict. This is also reflected in the writing. In addition to the breeding of practically economic and working horses, it will therefore always be a major task for the stud management of a country to breed a horse in the individual breeding areas that fully meets the wishes and requirements of the army. Very interesting here is that Germany had only very recently began to create breeding programs for mountain horses and mules, according to this statement. Since 1936, Germany had been approaching the breeding of mountain horses and mules in order to be able to bruise and restock this type of horse itself. The next part is about requirements, in particular around the breeds. Now it is important to point out here that in German the terminology for different main types of horses all contain the word blood in it. Now how shall the military horse be? Whenever there is a talk of the army or troop horse in general, one has only the noble half-blood horse in mind. Cold-blooded horses are only used in very small numbers for special purposes and few fur breeds are usually only used to provide officers with a mount. By the noble half-blood we mean the horse that has been highly refined by thoroughbreds breeds for generations and has been maintained and strengthened in its refinement for appropriate breeding choices. The requirements are expanded when it comes to the various attributes and quality of the body. Be aware, I might have translated some terminology here incorrectly, after all, I'm not a veterinarian. The army horse must have noble blood, good legs and hoofs, a regular swinging straight gait and strong back, desirable a long sloping shoulder, with us a well set neck, deep and broad chest and a strong croup with a good tail. Also required are a good muscular forearm with short tubes and dry tendons, strong broadly splinted hocks and pastons that are neither too soft nor too steep. Now I never really paid much attention to horses, yet after the, reading this it became rather obvious that some breeds are named after locations. This of course makes more sense if we consider the following. The breeding grounds. Since the horse is more than all other animal breeds a product of its soil, the individual types of horses will be sought and found in different numbers and qualities in the individual breeding areas. 
A part of the article also talks about proper certification. When selecting and purchasing three-year-old army horses, value is placed in a good and pure-blooded pedigree proven by breeding certificate. It seems that the certification were color-coded as well, depending on the horse heritage. These certifications are red if both parents are pure warm bloods, blue if the father is a thoroughbred sire, and white if the mother's pedigree cannot be sufficiently proven as warm blood. I'm not sure about you, but for me reading that stuff was rather eerie. After all, these parts were basically about blood, soil and certification. As such, I'm actually quite curious how much this information was common knowledge and if so, in which sense it might have affected the general acceptance of the Nuremberg laws and other issues. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. The article also discusses the various types of horses and I found some of these types actually quite hilarious. Please let me know in the comments which is your favorite type of military horse out there. Riding horse, Reitpferd, Draft horse, Zugpferd, Artillery Pole horse, Artillerie Stangenpferd, Cavalry Draft horse, Cavalerie Zugpferd, Infantry Draft horse, Infanterie Zugpferd, Machine Gun horse, Maschinengewehrpferd, Heavy Draft horse, Schweres Zugpferd, and of course the very heavy Draft horse. Sehr schweres Zugpferd. Now the book contains images of each of those horses, yet only discusses some of them briefly, namely the cavalry horse. The cavalry needs a common riding horse that has galloping ability, both strong and enduring, and this is not too demanding and sensitive. And of course, probably the most important horse, the draft horse. The draft horse in all its type needs to be less noble than the riding horse. A deep, broad, stocky horse that stands close to the ground and brings enough weight into the harness is especially desirable here. With him, two special emphasis is placed on gait, endurance and toughness. Additionally, mountain horses and mules are discussed shortly as well. As a mountain horse, the so-called Haflinger, a small, very tough and frugal horse bred in Tyrol, is particularly popular. Stick measure about 148, that's 4.86 feet. Its performance as a pack and draft animal is admirable. It also has sufficient trotting and galloping ability as a riding horse. The mules are used exclusively as pack animals. They are crossed between donkey stallion and horse mare. The North Americans have proven to be the best. I think it is not without irony that the Germans like the mule breed the most that was called North American. Anyway, let us move to another important aspect, namely officer horses. And since being an officer in the German army was a serious and very prestigious job, it was important that you look good on your horse, nor waste his time. An officer should always choose a well-ridden horse suited to his figure. The horse must cover him. Since he is to ride the horse in every service, he cannot be bothered with horses that are too young and unridden. Now it's quite funny here that Decken in German also means to breed and it was an official term, as you can see in the previous quotes, where there was a reference to the deck shine, the breeding certificate. Anyway, we are not finished with the ambiguous text passages yet. The officer's horse should be beautiful in exterior, devoted and willing in temperament, and walk alone and safely in the field. It must be especially tough and efficient, as well as acclimated to gunfire and music. After all, you want to use it near the front line and on parades. There was also an extensive article on riding in the encyclopedia. To give you some number, it had about 20 pages, whereas the article by Guderian on the Kraftfahrtruppen literary motor vehicle combat troops had about 21 pages. The article on pioneers had about 22, the one on the orientation about 5, one on organization about 12. Similarly, the book also contained an article with 5 pages on horse diseases. Note, I say about when it comes to pages, since I subtracted the page numbers. It's um, in some cases only a minor part of the page was covered. So take these values as a general guideline. And besides the article on the military horse I quoted before, there was also a general article on the horse itself, which included a graphical depiction of horse teeth with example teeth for determining the age, showing horse teeth layouts for horses with the ages of 5 years, 8 years and 12 years. The writing article also expresses the importance of military riding for both soldier and horse. Purpose: The military riding teaches the soldier the safe control of the horse in all positions, 
increases the performance and durability of the horse through proper physical training, educates and accustoms the horse to absolute obedience. Now some interesting trivia here, the German Army Regulation number 12, the Reitvorschrift, the Riding Regulations, is probably the most reprinted German Army Regulation out there. It is from 1937 but seems to be reprinted regularly with and without commentary. I also came across some interesting aspects that referred directly to the experience in the First World War. One very interesting aspect I came across was that it seems that in World War I there was a serious problem when it came to the use of driving horse wagons. The purpose of the driving training, the experience of the world war brought about the need for systematic training in drive horse wagons, literally driving from the wagon seat. In the old army there was a riding regulation but no driving regulation. Only after the world war did the Reichswehr ministry publish a draft of driving regulations for the Reichsheer. The supply service's observation about the campaigns in France and Russia sound extremely familiar to what would happen in the upcoming war. The performance of our horses was already extraordinarily high during the triumphal march through Belgium and France in 1914. But there are still man-made roads available. However, the demands on our draft horses are much more difficult in the wide areas of Russia, where there are only deep sand roads. But the worst of all is their work during the toy in Russia, where many horses perish by sinking into the swamp. Well, I think this is enough new material for now. I also came across some interesting instructions from 1943 and reports from 1944. Let us see how this video does and if you want to hear more on horses that goes beyond the usual rehashing of all the information. Thank you here to Andrew for reviewing the script and special thanks for Jack for sending me the book on, mechanized, on the mechanized juggernaut. Also thank you to all my supporters and patrons and subscribers. As always, there is a link in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.